So, uh, welcome. Uh, hardy survivors of last night's parties and people who have not yet left. Um, uh, to a discuss so, welcome to a discussion of a really important uh, issue, um, how we finance net zero, uh, moving from commitment to action. Um, I'm Martin Wolf. Uh, I work at the Financial Times, and I have followed this issue moderately closely for a couple of decades. Um, I think it's a very, very timely discussion, um, uh, and we are in one of those phases which have, have become really the dominant experience of the last uh, few years, perhaps longer uh, than that, perhaps forever, in which urgent matters of the moment overwhelming, overwhelm what we think of as really important for the long term. So it's, I think it's very, very important that we continue not only to discuss these issues, which I'll come to it in a moment, um, but translate them from the important to the really urgent column, um, because otherwise we're, we're going to fail um, pretty clearly. So we, I have a, uh, a superb panel. I've come to that. Um, who um, will uh, be? You'll be hearing from very soon. Um, I'll just introduce them. Uh, to my left is Anne Richards, who's chief executive officer of Fidelity International. Um, to her left is Mark Carney, who's United Nations special envoy for climate action and finance, and of course played a very big role in creating the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero G Fans and whom I, of course, knew as governor of the Bank of England, and I congratulated him yesterday on getting out in time. Uh, uh, the, uh, of course, this mess would not have happened if he'd been there. Uh, to his left is Martin Diop, who's managing director and executive price vice president of the International Finance Corporation, the central institution, and I was reminding him that I spent 10 uh, reasonably happy years in the World Bank in the 70s, at the beginning of my supposed career. And of course, at that stage, we in the World Bank, but he has made the transition, he explains to me, always regarded the IFC with profound suspicion. <laughs> Uh, I'll go into, I will, uh, I'm sure you recognize that, Magda. Uh, to his left is Celine Hewaya, um, uh, who's the Group Chief Sustainability Officer at HSBC, an institution that has recently been in the news. And finally, to her left is yeah. David Schwimmer, who's Chief Executive Officer of the London Stock Exchange Group. So we've got a very broad panel with lots to say on this vital subject. Um, all I'm going to say in introduction, because you didn't come here to listen to me, was that it's pretty obvious uh, that if we leave aside the fundamental question of political will, we have three things we need to fix this problem. Um, technologies that work, we've made a lot of progress on that, though there are still some pretty important holes, and lots of that's been discussed here. Incentives, uh, I, I expect people uh, I, I know some people will talk about that. Do we have the necessary incentives? And finally, uh, but uh, definitely not least, last but not least, money, finance. And the, none of this will happen if people don't put money into it, public and above all, clearly, private money. Um, uh, I've got here an estimate that it will need 50 trillion in incremental investment by 2050. That's actually, a, it sounds a very large sum. It's not quite as large as it, as it as sounds if it's over 30 years, but some of the figures I've seen are, lar are larger. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I will leave others to decide that, but I've seen double that, and Mark will discuss that. Anyway, these is not trivial sums which will have to be invested to get a return for investors, and uh, and the sorts of institutions represented here will play a central role in uh, bringing this about. Now, I just finally my role. I'm the moderator, of course, and uh, but I'm also a journalist, and it is my role uh, and my duty to be, and in this case, I am profoundly skeptical, <laughs> namely 
so I will challenge their assertions about the things that are going to happen. We will talk till about uh, 20 past nine or so, and then we will have Q&A. This is not a large group. You are, I'm sure, all very, very informed, and I hope we to get a, some lively questions. Um, <clears throat> please, uh, just before we get there, uh, as I like, I've made this comment very often, I do know the difference between a question and a statement. Questions can be, <laughs> questions can be done in one sentence, I promise you, and please make it a question. Question, and please don't say, I have just three questions. It's not fair for the other members of the audience. So with that introduction, I'm going to start with you, Mark, since you represent the United Nations, the world. Yeah. So how far are we along in fixing this? Uh, uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you all for taking the time and those uh, watching online. Um, first is uh, just on the scale. Um, we need uh, an energy transformation on the scale of the Industrial Revolution at the speed of the digital transformation. And therefore, we need a revolution in finance. I mean, just to be clear, we need to change mainstream finance. This is not, we're not going to get to net zero in a niche. I'm on double that number that you, you quoted like you uh, in terms of the orders of magnitude that need to be invested. Um, so, um, and if you think about what's the change, um, Look, with the Industrial Revolution, what we had was fractional reserve banking, increased uh, leverage and maturity transformation. Uh, you had central banks playing a new role, lender of last resort, and starting to supervise. And you had a international monetary system that was put together around the gold standard and the Bank of England uh, at the uh, center of that. Um, I just wanted to get that in there. Um, everything was fine with it. Uh, now, what do we need uh, for our financial system? We need to, instead of increased leverage, we need to reduce carbon leverage. Um, instead of maturity transformation, we need net zero alignment. And it's not just the banking system, it's the entire financial system. Central banks have a role in supervisors in terms of disclosure, foundational things, and focus on transition risks, not credit risks. Um, and then we do need a new um, uh, international uh, uh, financial system, and Makhtar can speak to that in terms of roles of blended finance, roles of carbon markets, carbon credit markets, offset markets. Now, where do we stand? Um, uh, GFANS, uh, thank you for mentioning the start. Uh, 130 trillion of balance sheet committed to that net zero alignment, not just 2050, fair share of 50% reduction of the emissions of their clients, so their portfolio, what they've invested in or lent to uh, by 2030, but also bringing it forward from that, five-year decarbonization plans that need to be rolled out and annual reporting. Those commitments made in Glasgow, hence the name, uh, back in November, so what the institutions are doing is uh, working through and developing those decarbonization plans, and it won't surprise you that that means engaging with the people they invest in uh, or lend to for their own plans. Last point I'll make by way of introduction is what is coming out um, in uh, the middle of June um, for public consultation is uh, very detailed guidance for what is good, what is best practice for financial institution net zero plans, what we expect from uh, private companies uh, for their plans, what are the sectoral pathways, because after all, if you're transitioning, you have to align with a pathway along the route to net zero. Saying you're going to get there in 2050 doesn't do anybody any good. It's where you're getting to over the course of the next several years uh, for alignment. And then the last point I'll make, uh, and, and there's other elements to this, how you phase out stranded assets, et cetera. Last point I'll make uh, by way of introduction is this is about real world decarbonization not the false comfort of portfolio decarbonization. The easiest thing to do uh, is to sell and walk away, make it somebody else's problem. The only way we're going to get here, and it is a, you know, your, your challenge, your, your, I, I wouldn't say skepticism, but your challenge is right because of the scale of the, uh, of, of the issue. Uh, it requires engagement and putting money behind those companies who have plans to get emissions down. So thank you very much. The, the, uh, your opening um, fits into something that I've sort of thought and written about a lot, which is, uh, I think, a helpful way of framing it at the biggest picture, which is we didn't, my view is that we didn't have an industrial revolution in the 19th century. We had an energy revolution yeah. from which industry followed. Namely, the revolution was the shift um, from essentially uh, direct solar power to fossil fuels. And the, um, 
uh, and the energy system has been the core of our rising prosperity ever since. And we basically want to re-engineer the entire energy system in three decades while still having a functioning economy. And I think that gives you a sense of the magnitude of this. Um, I would like to talk to you, Anne, as uh, representative of an important institution that fits into the challenge that Mark has specified. So can you do it? I don't know, but we're going to have a damn good go. Okay. I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the bottom line. I mean, I think, you know, I think uh, credit to Mark. I mean, to your introduction of Mark, um, he is regarded as being a very, very lucky central banker. Just going to put that out there. So we're hoping he's going to be as lucky in his role that he, it, with the transformation that he's trying to engineer on this, because he's done an absolutely fantastic job. And unity is one of the key things that I think we're trying to aspire to. We can't do it as an investment house on our own. Mark can't do it alone. None of the people in this room probably can do it alone. We've got to try and collaborate. And a positive note on that is I see through GFANS and through some of the other collaborations that we work with, there is a great coalition of the willing to really try. Um, but it's difficult. You don't want every financial institution designing their own framework. You don't want every country designing their own accounting standards. We've got to try and do the things that make it easy for people to do the right things in their business. So that's the first point. Transition frameworks, Mark touched on this, so important. We've got to tackle both the demand and the supply side very much acknowledging that the transition is going to be more painful in certain areas. So as we change the supply of energy that you talked about, as we move to different forms of energy, we've got to try and get the investment into the communities that are going to be most impacted by that so that you create the positive economic virtuous cycle of jobs and prosperity in those communities. We've also got to tackle the demand side, though, and I think that's where there is still a huge gap. We haven't got the demand side measures. We haven't got the firmness of conviction from governments to create the incentives and the nudges to help people make better choices on the demand side, which will be a huge accelerant in what we're trying to do here. And then the final point is we spend a lot of time talking about what's going on in listed markets. There's a vast swathe of the world's economy actually is privately held enterprises. It's the SME sector in many, many economies. So we've got to help those parts of the economy do their heavy lifting and make it easy for them to do that heavy lifting so that we can, again, try and get this acceleration and this virtuous cycle going. Coming back to your initial question, I don't know if we can do it. It's a wicked problem in a social science sense. No one actor can do it alone. And I think the only way we can really have a good shot at doing what we need to do to keep to that magical one and a half degrees is if we keep trying to work together and persuade the doubters to play their part in giving this a shot for all the reasons that you mentioned at the outset. So at this stage, I'd like to talk to you, go to you, Marta. Um, this is a point I make, have made in many, many presentations. I mean, this is, as is the job of journalists, oversimplifying, but essentially this is a developing country issue in the sense that developed countries clearly created the problem. There's no doubt about that in the past, but if you look at it, where we are now in terms of global emissions and where everybody knows all the potential growth in emissions will come from, it will be from emerging and developing countries. What is more, um, these, the people in these countries, the vast majority of, hu of humanity, uh, many live very energy poor lives, which has profound implications for their standards of living in many, many ways. Um, so they ha clearly have a right and, uh, written a lot about this recently, um, we, uh, to a higher energy future. So there you are in the IFC. Where do you fit into that, I think, the, really the core of the challenge? Um, and how are we going to be able to meet that challenge? No, th th I think that I just want to rebound on a couple of things that have been said. I think first on, uh, on uh, emerging economies, for me there is a lot of heterogeneity. Talking about the low, low income countries that you have in Africa, and talking about the middle income countries which are, which are uh, large emitters, among those middle income countries, those who are producing coal, for instance, and co using it for electricity, 
and those who are only using coal for electricity generation. We have different categories and different instruments that we need to, to use to address those, those issues. And I think that the work that Mark has been uh, uh, you know, coordinating, looking at some of the middle-income countries among the 20 largest emitters, we have these, two, these different categories. Let's take countries like South Africa, Indonesia. Uh, the, the reality is totally different for Vietnam. Vietnam, the, 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 the mainly is the financial issues. They have investment in coal that uh, have a life, uh, uh, life cycle of 20, economic life of two, uh, 40 years, and uh, now they have uh, only 11 years, so they need to buy back those assets. Uh, Indonesia is more complicated because it has a social implication, and uh, in, uh, in South Africa it's the same because you have miners who, who are producing it. So when we're looking at it, we need we're uh, looking at it holistically, and I think the transition that we are making in thinking about the financing is to go beyond just uh, getting assets and uh, taking care of assets, but also looking at the broader issues which are the social implication of it. Second, the point that you make is great about uh, not leaving anybody. We are talking about grading the value chain. But most of the, a big part of the value chain is composed of uh, SMEs in developing countries. And the risk that we are facing is that by greening it, we exclude those people from the global value chain and increase the risk of, uh, uh, that we are facing currently. So uh, the, the work that I see we are trying to do is to see how we can accompany specifically those SMEs. It's more complicated because the financial sector, which is trying to set standard in terms of greening the, the financial sector, has to, to trace their lending to the sub-loans at the loan to these small companies, and there is, is more challenging. So all our work right now is to understand more, more specific that dynamics and be able. Last point is about uh, working together. Uh, it's interesting, uh, COP21, government, NGOs. COP26, uh, private sector. And they say that it was at the four steps that they left, were let in. COP27, I think everybody agrees that this is the solution. But what we, we, are, we, we, are, we are seeing is that we need to, to de-risk and blend. So uh, we have instruments for low-income countries. For middle-income countries, that's what I think we've marked, we are looking at those countries, how to get this large amount of money to able to, to blend and de-risk it. And I think the solutions that we have now with philanthropy coming and working with us, uh, uh, DFIs, and, uh, and, and also uh, uh, a different part, uh, will help us uh, find a way to de-risk more investment in this area. Thank you very much. Um, that certainly sets out a big agenda um, to um, discuss. Um, may I um, move, move to you, um, Celine? Uh, um, so you are representing a very large bank uh, um, which operates globally, particularly in Asia. So how does this issue and challenge look to you? How does it affect your actual lending operations, a very different sort of function from fidelity. Um, I mean, what sort of, actually, what do you do about it? <laughs> yeah, it's, so I think the first thing is there's, there's been a massive shift in our operating environment since we've all made these net zero commitments. And I want to bring that a little bit to life. And this is all new, and we're all learning by doing a lot. This is, this is very nascent, right? <coughs> so the first thing is when a bank like ours sets a net zero by 2050 commitment, the other thing we also do is have a shorter term 2030 commitment around our financed emissions. That's the <coughs> emissions that come from our portfolio of, of customers. These aren't just targets that we kind of think about in 2030. The work starts today. So we set these targets. They then, it then means we need to adjust our risk appetite how we do financial planning, our strategic portfolio allocation, and decisions we make at the point of origination as we look at the financed emissions from a deal. Now, how that actually gets brought to life for us is there's this whole new thing of a client transition plan, a whole new ask. So this year, we published in February our targets for oil and gas and power and utility sectors, the most carbon-intensive ones first. We've got another seven to come next year. But straight away, when we publish those, we have an ask out now to our largest clients in those sectors, over hundreds, to say, we need your transition plan by the end of the year. And if you're in a non-OECD country, by the end of the year after that. So now there's a period of really active engagement with our bankers, with our experts, to discuss these transition plans. And it's the transition plans where you bring it to life, because it's not just about emissions today. It's, it's where is the CAPEX investment going? What is your strategy to adjust your business model if you're in oil and gas to a, a future where you actually have, you know, no longer growth in oil demand, but decline, term, you know, a decline in oil demand over the decades to come. 
Um, and alongside that, we also have to make structural changes to our policies. So we have a coal phase out policy that we launched uh, at the end of last year. This year, we're working, we're going to be working very hard on how, how do we update oil and gas? How do we think about the IEA's recommendations around no new oil and gas reserves? How do we think about the treatment of unconventionals and conventionals? How do we think about methane, given the Glasgow Climate Pact and the important role of methane? We're going to be looking at meteorological coal. We're going to be looking at deforestation again. So we really have to align our policy framework. But fundamentally, and coming back to your point, Martin, you know, HSBC is, is very, we're very different from a, a French or even some of the UK banks that have more of a, a Western exposure. You know, the biggest role HSBC can play, in, and our goal has to be a net zero global economy, not just a net zero financed emissions portfolio of HSBC, because that won't help the world. Our goal has to be a net zero global economy, and that means we have to be involved in the, the transition finance of the heavy industry in Asia, of the energy sector in Asia. And that means we can't introduce very blunt policy tools or thresholds that might work in the West. We can't say overnight, OK, you can only have 30% or 20% coal in your energy mix, because that would mean we couldn't work, we couldn't finance the large energy, state-owned energy companies in Indonesia or Philippines or Malaysia. And then we couldn't help on the transition. And, and, and that's the biggest carbon wedge impact we can have is helping on the transition in the areas where the emissions growth is the highest. Um, just quickly, on the other side, we also made a commitment, you know, and many of the banks have made commitments to unleash capital for the green, the transition. So we have a one trillion commitment by 2030. We've got, you know, seven and a half years left. And there's challenges with that. There's a lot of challenges because actually the green stuff at the moment is quite hard to finance. On one side of it, you've got the the infrastructure, the project infrastructure, long tenor, even if you have a sovereign backing and a high RWA, high risk weighted assets, it's still our bank sheets as a commercial bank aren't used to having lots of long tenor deals on them, right? And so it's difficult for us to get involved in the clean infrastructure finance. So if we want to, which we do want to, we have to make some adjustments. We have to have a culture, a mindset shift, a, a, a risk appetite shift for a portion of our balance sheet. And on the other side, you've got the new stuff, the technologies, our bankers and our credit risk teams aren't used to evaluating uh, the, the new companies. And likewise there, you've got lower RWAs. And again, we're going to have to have capital loading on them for the early year. So actually, at the moment, there's a, there's a disincentive for us to invest in the stuff we really need to scale and invest in. And so we have to work out how to do that. And you know, a big thing for us is building that new capability, building that new capability of of internally of people upskilling our frontline bankers, but people that can really help advise our bankers internally on what the future of industry looks like. Thank you very much. Very good introduction to the many complicated issues. And finally, David, um, public markets. What a role do they play? Well, Martin, I have to say, as Anne mentioned, it's a lot, about a lot more than just public markets, but a critical role uh, for public markets, private markets, policy makers. Uh, London Stock Exchange Group, we're a financial markets infrastructure and data provider across the trade life cycle. Uh, in that role, we are an intermediary. We are an enabler. And within that space, we spend a lot of time dealing with uh, issuers. We spend a lot of time dealing with investors, the allocators of capital. And a number of my fellow panelists have talked about the, uh, the engagement, the dialogue that has taken place already, uh, but also the need for more. So whether it's GFANCE, whether it's Climate Action 100 Plus, a, a number of other different organizations have attempted to make this uh, a clearer space, a more understandable transition, but we have a lot more work to do from that perspective. So, uh, for example, in our interaction with issuers, there are, uh, there are a lot of issuers out there who do not understand the kind of transformation we are going through, the transformation the world has to go through. And by that, I mean a significant change in how capital is allocated, <clears throat> a change in the cost of capital based on sustainability, change in the cost of capital based on transition plans. So, We've made big changes and a lot of progress in the last couple of years, uh, but a lot more to do. And I would say similarly on the issuer side, I'm sorry, on the, uh, on the investor side, uh, those who have the capital uh, and who are looking to allocate it, they are making enormous demands as part of this transition and they don't always understand the impact that those demands have on the issuers. 
and the confusion it creates and the challenge that it creates. So there is a, a disconnect there. Uh, that is one thing that I am working on with a number of others in the industry. We, we have a work stream within GFANCE on <clears throat> real economy transition pathways with a focus on the particularly high emitting sectors, uh, aviation, steel, oil and gas. Uh, as Mark mentioned, a number of reports coming out soon. Our report uh, in that particular work, work stream is coming out in September uh, to try to bridge this disconnect between those who have the capital uh, and those who are looking for the capital. A second critical element of this, and there's been a lot of discussion around this, but we're not there yet, is disclosure and getting standardized comparable disclosure on a global basis. Today, again, we've made a lot of progress, but today 40% plus of uh, global large and mid cap companies do not disclose their emissions. Uh, and those that do disclose, often their data, because of uh, the lack of standards uh, on, or a standardized framework, for those who do disclose, they're often wildly inaccurate. So we have a real challenge there in terms of disclosure. Uh, and in part due to that, uh, LSEG has called for, uh, we, we put out a, a paper on this a couple of weeks ago, we have called for governments to require uh, on a global basis publicly traded companies, private sector companies across economies, uh, disclosure of emissions based on uh, a baseline of ISSB uh, work that is coming. Uh, we would also like to see a uh, required disclosure of climate transition plans, again, across economies on a global basis. And we would also like to see uh, governments, policymakers require companies to disclose their revenue broken down by green and non-green sources so that that can help uh, the allocators of capital allocate that capital to uh, the sources that uh, they are looking to invest in. And then the final piece of this, is a, and Mark touched on this in his opening remarks, is that we have to focus on the transition for the big carbon emitters. We cannot just green the portfolios. Uh, we have been relying on fossil fuels, as Martin, you mentioned, for 200 years. We cannot flick a switch uh, and make this kind of transformation. It will take decades. And the allocators of capital need to work with those high emitters in terms of helping to uh, drive that transition. So those are maybe some of the more uh, operating level uh, okay. developments that we have to Let's focus Let's go on. through just two or three really big issues that arise here um, to get some sense of, from the, the specific aspects you're each looking at, what it looks like as a big picture. So one of the subjects we've discussed in the past, Mark, and which I think we should bring in here, uh, because pretty obvious reasons, I'll come to this in a moment, I'm really concerned about all sorts of ways people arbitrage around this. So the, um, the incentive environment and the regulatory environment to make this actually work in the timetable, how far are we mm. from what we need? And that, you know, what needs to be done, and obviously a fundamental role is government policy in this, I don't want to go into detail, but just, you know, okay, yeah. sort of people come to you and say, yeah, this is a lovely idea, mm -hmm. but I can't might make money doing this. Uh, yeah, look, I think that it's fair to say that what happened at COP26 is the private sector moved ahead of uh, exactly. governments. Uh, and there is some closure of the gap between the two, but there needs governments need to move much, much faster. Part of that is around, uh, and I'm just going to want to endorse everything that David just said about mandatory disclosure, mandatory net zero transition plans. That's where we need to go, and that's partly a role of government. But your core of your question is not that. It is about the incentives and the credibility of those incentives and the clarity around it. Uh, let me give you a few examples quickly of what works and what has the impact. So yes, it does matter that 90% of global emissions are under some form of net zero commitment by countries. Or, and you know that was a third of global emissions uh, last time people got together at Davos, so a huge shift there. Um, it does matter those countries, the UK would be an example, EU, Canada is uh, becoming an example, that mark to market their policies relative to their commitments. So they have independent bodies that check 
the Climate uh, Change uh, Commission in, uh, I, I think that's the name of it, in the UK is probably the best example of this, and shows the gap between the policies and the commitments. And the question, of course, is for the private sector uh, and all stakeholders is, well, are they going to close the gap? And do they have credibility to close the gap? And if so, the financial sector, one of its strengths is it looks forward and it allocates capital in anticipation of that. That's what everyone is doing at the moment, is expecting that some of this gap is going to be closed. Maybe not all of it, but some of it's going to be closed. So what are the policies that are most effective? And I'll stop with this. Um, they are deep decarbonization policies that are far enough in the future uh, that companies can do something about them, but near enough that they have to. So uh, in Canada, uh, the carbon price is legislated to $170 a ton in 2030. It is now going to be backed up by something called a contract, carbon contract for differences. Um, and uh, that's, that's what's decisive for investment today. It happens to be $50 a ton today, but the hundred, that's interesting. The 170 is what matters. Um, in uh, the UK and Europe, uh, the end of internal combustion engine vehicle sales in 2035, 2030 in some countries, that's decisive for the auto industry and investment in auto. Um, fuel blends are other examples. So those types of very clear commitments that are anchored probably around 2030 or thereabouts help to focus the mind for the types of investments that are necessary. And then uh, last thing I'll say is that um, we talk about sectoral pathways. It seems an innocuous phrase, but it's a very important thing because the question is, what are you transitioning to as a country uh, as a financial sector, as companies, um, and how do you know, how do you mark your homework? How do you know that you're doing a good job? Uh, and how do you know that the company you're backing with a loan or an investment is sufficiently ambitious uh, <coughs> given the incentive environment and given what has to be done if we're going to stay on, on this very narrow pathway to one and a half degrees? I think it is true, I'm just remembering this, that more than half of global emissions come from China and the US. Is that correct? Um, I think it is about half. It, I, the, yeah, that's a, yeah, let's say that. Let's say that. Um, the, really um, the, I think that's roughly right. I mean, come to me correct this because I was from dredge from memory. But the point is the world of countries that have actually gone a long way in your direction is still a pretty small share of the world's emissions. I think it's... It's this... Yeah. I'm going to come to this with Mahta because it's yeah. how the policy... Um, that's a pretty big issue, isn't it? It's a big issue. I think that the it is a big issue, although um, there is pr some of this progress in China, including with the ETS. Um, I would say that thus far what has happened is because the EU and the UK are relatively big markets for multinational corporations, and they have the greater policy clarity, that some other countries have been free riding on the policy leadership, in the, not that it's perfect in the EU and the UK, uh, and they need to catch up. There is this argument that we can't produce anything, but we're very good at exporting regulation. Um, <laughs> I, I won't go into that. It's a growth, so, it's a growth uh, industry. Uh, uh, it's a global public good. Yeah. <coughs> Marta, I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, <laughs> the cooperation, collaboration between um, developed high-income countries and developing countries, particularly low-income countries, which your in institution embodies, and what needs to be done to de-risk investment or uh, in uh, and finance, um, um, and what role public, uh, in multilateral institutions like yours can play in immensely increasing the flow of investment that will be needed um, to support the transition in and the growth of energy supply in the sorts of countries you're dealing with. I think that we talked a lot about financial intermediation and capital market, not enough about real sector. Right. And I think that uh, when you talk about uh, to, to the bankers and the financiers, what they tell, tell you, do we have enough bankable projects which are, can help us have the impact that we want? So the first thing is to really work harder to have a much stronger pipeline. Secondly, we need to be much more centrally adaptation. Adaptation, I think, is a bit uh, the orphan in that conversation. And we talk a lot about mitigation, but much less about, uh, about. And I'm very glad that we have now the a commission that has been uh, a bit by Taman on water, that will be uh, discussing a little bit the impact of uh, water, the relation between water and climate change, because I think there will be a so big uh, discussion on, on, on it. On the policy front, I think, uh, Mark, you, you already did it, uh, uh, carbon price and fossil fuel uh, subsidies. 
we need to go to continue discussing up on fossil fuels subsidies is still there and it's a little bit forgotten right now, but we need to bring back that conversation uh, at the center. When I'm thinking about real, real sector, we have a uh, low hanging fruit that we are not uh, really tapping on, gas flaring. Uh, we have huge amount uh, of, of gas flaring which is here, and uh, if uh, the regulation was put in place in more advanced economy, we could do uh, so, so, something about it. Cooling. If you look at the demand, the evolution of the demand in emerging countries, it happens that most of these countries are hot countries. So the demand for cooling and the impact on, uh, on, emission, on, uh, yeah. on things would be uh, very little is done about it. In Glasgow, basically, we didn't have a panel on, on, on cooling. Yeah. Third, housing and, and norm. We see urbanization growing fast in emerging economies. We are working on, at IFC on having standard on edge to make sure that we are reducing the, the, the consumption uh, uh, of, of household. So uh, those are public, public policies and regulations that can help very much on the demand side on the energy efficiency, because I think that we have a long way to, to go. I want, there are some countries where we live where you, in winter you have, you, you, you have to, to, be, to, wear, to, to wear a T-shirt and, uh, and, uh, in, in, in your house, and in, uh, in, uh, in summer you have to put a sweater. I'm not sure that is a more efficient way of, of managing uh, electricity uh, 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 consumption. So all these kind of things uh, are for me low-hanging fruits and which have a, a political uh, cost which is much lower than some of, of the questions that we, will, we, are, we are talking about. Lastly is uh, having annual measurement. And there, Mark, I fully agree with you. Yeah. When you look at the first generation of NDCs, it was a nicely defined, longer term, uh, not always very precise on, in terms of commitment. And uh, we are at the World Bank Group and IFC moving now with CCDRs, which are diagnostic by country where we're trying every year now to say what are the investment needed, where it should be done by, by, by the country, and to have something that we can measure uh, 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 over time, but in a very pre pre precise manner. Last thing, measurement. We're talking about measurement issues in, in, uh, in listed companies. Think about measurement issues in, uh, in, uh, in uh, emerging economies. You go in every Ministry of Environment in uh, developing countries, mm -hmm. and you ask them how they measure emission, you know, you, and you leave the meeting with some uh, big questions about really the measurement impact. So technical assistance comp accompanying those countries is important to be able to do the taxonomies that we, we need to have in countries. And extremely important qu points which underline even more the challenges we face. And let me ask you a, a question I've been meaning to ask somebody like you for some time, which goes something like this. You are a fiduciary. People put money with you, um, not because they may put money with you because they profoundly admire your climate goals, but they probably put money with you because they want you to make them rich. Um, so, uh, and that's your duty in a sense. Um, certainly not, you, you don't have a business if you make them poor. So how do you persuade them that your climate goals, the, the ambitions you have, are consistent with their goals and keep their money. So, it, you know, and that's actually at the core of, you know, what we're trying to do as a business. It's, yes, it's a exactly great question. And it's, and it's both. I mean, nobody wants to see their long-run financial returns sacrificed on the, or, uh, you know, on the altar of some principles. So, but they do want to know that the returns that they have made have contributed to rather than damage the, the planet that we all share to take it down to its sort of you know, absolute core. And I think it's interesting, if you look back over the last, I would say, four years. Now, clients are not absolutely unanimous in how they approach this. There are different approaches from different clients. So it's important to say that there are different priorities in different parts of the world and even within different client groups within that. But in general, if you look at the client meetings that we're having today and have been having over the last two years, it is almost never that you don't have sustainability raised as part of that conversation. Whereas if you went back even five years, the SRI, the ESG agenda was a niche and a strand as opposed to a mainstream part of the conversation. So yes, we have a duty to create financial returns for our clients. That's why they hire us, but we have to do it 
as an and. And so the climate goals, the things that we're aspiring to do with the portfolios are very much in conjunction with where the clients are telling us and how they, how they expect their money to be looked after. And that's how you bring it together. I'm going to you, David, and Selena, the last word in this exchange. One of the things that is obvious to anyone who looks at markets in, from outside is that we're getting a pretty massive reshuffling of companies from public into private holding. And uh, there are some very famous cases. You know them better than I do. So one of the things I've been wondering is whether at the end of your efforts, stock markets and so forth, uh, what we're going to see is all the, as it were, good, respectable, low carbon, non-problematic sectors will be with you and you can add up the carbon emissions of the publicly quoted companies in the London Stock Exchange or New York Stock Exchange, they'd all look wonderful. And all the heavy emitters, the oil companies, uh, the aviation companies, will be held in some other way which makes them effectively invisible. In which case, we've just reshuffled the ownership of lots of assets and have changed nothing useful by this. How would you respond to that? Because, I mean, it's a genuine concern of mine about all this, and I'd be interested in your reaction. So it should be a genuine concern of yours, because in many ways it's already happening. Yeah. Right. And if th th there's no clean way to describe or define this, but over the last couple of years, we have seen that happening as there has been a focus on what has been referred to as greening portfolios. Yep. Uh, and whether that's greening investors, public investors' portfolios, or whether that's greening the asset portfolios of publicly traded companies. We have seen sales of, whether it's coal assets uh, or other high emission assets, uh, brown assets, whatever, whatever you want to call them, to, in some cases, private equity, in, in some cases, uh, state-owned businesses that are not being held to these kinds of uh, standards that we are all talking Very about here. So this is why when I was talking earlier, uh, if there are disclosure standards, if uh, there are requirements by governments uh, to put better information out on this, it has to be economy-wide. It cannot be just for publicly traded companies. It has to be for private. Uh, has to be for state-owned companies. And there, we are working on this issue. A, a lot of the big private equity firms, a lot of big pension funds are aware of this issue, are aware of the challenge. Uh, their LPs are focused on it. And so, again, as with much of what we're trying to do here, it's about building coalitions uh, and getting the best from voluntary behavior. But it is critical when this does become mandatory, as it should, it has to be mandatory across the economies, across private and public. So, Lee, I'll come back yep. to you in the last word. You're doing very badly on timing. <laughs> entirely my fault, of course. But the, um, uh, a very similar question arises about banking, and I couldn't not raise this. A uh, former colleague, or I don't know where he is now, Stuart Kirk, challenged the model of the, the bank, as I understood it. I happen to know Stuart very well. He was a colleague of mine, so I'm not at all surprised. But the, there's an interesting question which is related to what he said, and I hope you can comment very briefly to clarify your position. Okay, you come along as a lender uh, with all these requirements in your lending of the, the sort of loans you want to make, and your clients say, uh, well, this is a competitive business. You're a fiery five bank. I love your relation, my relationship with you for the last 30 years, but I'm going to go through all these hoops. I'm going to go through any one of a number of other major banks in the Asia region, for example. You know the list. Um, so you're not going to make any difference at all. You're just going to reshuffle your portfolio too. How would you respond to that? So first of all, I expected a question on, on the recent Yeah, I was incident. unavoidable, I'm afraid. <laughs> you warm me up for that in coffee time. Um, I mean, I think the, st the starting point is, I mean, you just heard for the entire panel about the, the kind of secular risk that we're now facing. Um, and, you know, and I think there was, you know, for, I won't go and dissect, and I can say that for another time, the arguments that were, were made in that. But I think the starting point time, for us, right. and have the time, no. no. The, the starting point for us is, um, you know, transition to net zero is one of our four strategic pillars. 
It's, you know, the focus pretty much of every single board meeting since I joined a year ago, every single exec meeting. It's a huge transformation job across the bank. It's a huge capability build. And yes, there are a lot of people in the bank working on this because there's a massive value creation and destruction happening in the economy because of it. And we have to understand, and as Anne said, it's a COE issue now. Any one of our clients is a top issue that executives wants to, want to engage on. Um, and as I said you know, earlier when I was talking, I think the, the reason when, we're, when it's down to client by client conversations, we're having the conversation around transition. So we're not trying to make a decision ASAP on exit. We're trying to have the engagement process, the conversation, the push, you know, how robust is that transition plan? How, uh, how quickly are you phasing down your coal PPAs, for example? How, what is your cap level of CAPEX investment? Is it fast enough? Is it good enough? Who could you collaborate with? So it's that process of engagement with the, area, the sectors that are hardest to abate, where the highest emissions are coming from, which is crucial. And if we don't do that, right, and, I, and no, we, yes, we need policy interventions, but finance does have a critical responsibility to, uh, to play a role as well, and we're taking that very seriously. Mark, you had a word yeah, I, before I go to the audience. Yeah, just very quickly on this issue. It's an important issue, but let me let me put it in context. First, every major, every global systemic bank, uh, with the exception of two in, in China, is part of GFENS. Therefore, any leverage for a transaction that goes into the into these dark shadows, they own those emissions. They have to disclose those emissions if they provide a leverage against it, as do a number of other leverage providers. So, you know, okay, great, you can take it private. Uh, and hide, but if you can't leverage it, your return is uh, changed a bit. So that's one element of it. Second, that's one point. Second is uh, we need all the pri big private equity firms in uh, to have the same standards as the public uh, investors. There are some in. They're not all in. They should all be in, just to be absolutely clear. Um, thirdly, David's absolutely right. The disclosure has to cover the whole thing, uh, the whole market. The UK is phasing it in its mandatory disclosure, but that has to happen for the world. Uh, and then the last thing, um, which is, uh, and this we're putting this out for consultation over the next six months, is, um, look, there are a lot of stakeholders, and I understand why they do this, and they stand up and they say, you have to divest, you have to get out of no coal, no this, no that. Well, who's going to wind it down? Who's going to man it? Like, what is responsible phasing out of these assets? What is the framework for doing that? What's the time frame? What's the ownership? Do you want the people who are committed to transition to net zero? to have that exposure and ensure that it's wound down, or do you want it uh, to keep the incentives to push it out? Mm -hmm. So we've run a little over, but we can now go to questions. Uh, what I will do, I will take three questions in a group. They will be one sentence. If you want it for a particular person, say who it is. Say who you are and ask the question. I'll start with the lady there. Please stand up. Wait, you need, there's a microphone. Um, go ahead, just go Hi, ahead. Hi, thanks, Martin. I'm Vaishali Sinha from Renew Power, which is India's leading renewable energy company, and we generate 13 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy. Very pointed question to multilaterals and financial institutions. I think the pace of innovation and uh, uh, creative uh, finance uh, is limited. Uh, we experience that on the ground. Uh, the capital uh, requirements are different, and I think institutions such as yours can do a lot more to keep up with the growth which is required in the sector for mitigation and adaptation. Can you tell us, is, is it possible to see you do more? To what is the possible? Uh, to do to be more innovative as far as green finance is concerned oh, for renewable energy okay. companies. Okay. Yes, I. Um, uh, further, the lady there. Yeah. Hello, uh, Deborah McCoy with Bain and Company. My question is about exchanges. I was interested in the G fans that some, but not all, exchanges have signed up to have net zero commitments. Could you uh, comment on either? Uh, market efficiency, potential arbitrage, or what do you think about exchanges as intermediaries for that? And I'll take a third question. Uh, the gentleman there. So my name is Slava. I'm CEO of a company called Mighty Buildings. We're decarbonizing the physical construction process with 3D printing and composite materials. I have a question to private banks. Um, uh, are there any like efforts to share quick wins and you know programs that really work to decarbonize the uh, you know, industries that are heavy emitters, because I think like the private sector can do a lot in sharing those and, you know, and especially those that we have verified. So this is about sharing information. Sharing information, building global database yeah. of like quick wins and programs that help decarbonize the real industries, not just 
without greenwashing or selling off car carbon. So I'm going to start with uh, Marta and Celine. Have you, are you being sufficiently creative in, I think, particularly in the context of, a, well, very major developing countries, India, but in, in green finance? Does it work well enough? I think it works. I mean, you give you a very specific example. Uh, between 2012 and 2018 in Africa, the solar uh, cost was uh, in 2012, 23 cents. Uh, with the support of IFC, it, uh, the last auction at that time was at uh, six cents. Six cents. Since then, it went down to one cents. Just to show that, that the innovations that we brought was uh, transparency, simplifying the, the, the contractual process, because one of the big problems that we have seen developers facing the time it takes to complete the preparation of a project. So we try to compress as much the, as possible the time, have standard documents, and that help a lot on bringing the bidding and the competition and the price down. Uh, in terms of financing, we are using a lot of blended finance for low-income count, low country to use what you call the private sector window, which is basically de-risking. And we are currently working closely with uh, foundations, Rockefeller Foundation, uh, Bezos Foundation, to increase the pot of money available to de-risk uh, uh, the cost of investing in, a green, in green uh, uh, energy, particularly in low-income countries. So those are the type of innovations that we are uh, having. In addition, we're expanding it to other part of, of, of the of, uh, other sectors, blue. We have issued the first blue bond for Indorama recently because we consider that also an important issue that we need to tackle in the climate change conversation. We are also ensuring that we are moving solely from green and uh, uh, bonds that we're issuing to social bonds. And it's very much a question that was asked about how we help country to transition and company to transition. Because part of this transition is uh, to buy assets, but also to help on the social cost of the transition, which are linked to, to moving from a carbon intensive activities. So this is a type of innovation, but you know, you are welcoming new ideas. We would love to, to have new ideas. Celine, anything more on making this less ponderous? I mean, I'd, the, the top line issue is that we're not doing enough of it yet, anywhere near enough. No one is, right? If you think about, we've got a 40% increase in energy demand by the end of this decade the amount we need to decline in coal in the energy mix. And now we've got the energy crisis on top. It was already a very unstable transition that we were in at the moment. We need whatever we can do to accelerate capital. So, you know, as I mentioned before, it, it's not easy for banks to digest on our balance sheet these large project finance deals, even when we have sovereigns backing them. Policy environments are very important. I take the example of Indonesia, one of the most abundant areas in terms of renewable resource potential, but probably the most difficult uh, geography to finance renewables in at the moment because of a number of different uh, difficult policy things from local content laws to contract issues and things. So I think there's a combination of, of working with policymakers, working with DFIs, Makda and I are discussing a lot in terms of what we can do on the blended finance and innovation around there. But absolutely a huge focus. I think our attention very and our appetite very much is to scale up what we can do in financing renewables and related uh, infrastructure, grid infrastructure, um, and also things like hydrogen, which are going to be critical from an energy storage perspective. So, David, the role of exchanges. So, Deborah's question raises a really important issue that applies to potential arbitrage among exchanges, but it could apply to potential arbitrage among regulatory regimes exactly. in any context. Regulatory arbitrage, big time. I, I, exactly. So, uh, that is why I, Mark, and others. Uh, have been emphatic on this point that if we are putting these rules in place, we have to uh, put them in place on a global basis. And ISSB is pushing down that path in terms of standards, but we will need governments and policymakers to implement them, again, on a global basis, specifically to the question on exchanges, just to spell out the issue if the London Stock Exchange has uh, more onerous requirements and other exchanges do not, that leads uh, to issuance in other places by those who don't want to deal with uh, the more challenging standards. Uh, your, your specific question was, are all exchanges in GFANCE? So uh, a, a number of exchanges are in GFANCE, but I should point out GFANCE is a, a critical alliance here, but it is not the only one. Uh, Mark and I were uh, pre-GFANCE involved yeah. in pulling exchanges together around the world uh, in, under the auspices of the UN, the UN Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative. And we do have exchanges all over the world. It's not every one, but it is most of the uh, critical exchanges around the world who have signed up to model guidance aligned with TCFD uh, 
as the ISSB moves forward, I would expect that we, we uh, bring that alignment forward so that there is work across the exchanges to try to avoid that kind of regulatory arbitrage. But we need to avoid it uh, across regulation as opposed to not just in the context of exchanges. Does any, either of you want, either any of you, particularly Mark and Land, uh, want to comment on information sharing? I, I could have a go at that one, actually, because yeah. I was just thinking, I think it's a great question, and I think it's particularly relevant when you look at fragmented industries. You mentioned construction. I think agriculture is another one. Um, I think policy really helps at a government level in some of these industries, but playbooks help, and the development of sector-specific playbooks, which get quite granular and which then can be disseminated, and it will vary, whether it's through trade associations or other mechanisms, but we have to actually drive at quite a granular level right the way down so that you're you know, one step up from subsistence farming, for example, or your small-scale house builder in, in a developing country actually knows how to easily to make good choices that you know, lower intensity in the materials that are used, the way that the buildings are put together or the way that the crops are actually managed that they make it easy for them to make good choices, because at the moment it's quite hard. I think it's a great point. I don't yeah. know, Mark, if you don't yeah, know three very quick points on it. One, um, there is an example on information sharing or, or common approaches around infrastructure, fast infrastructure, which, and one of the things GFANS has done is gone through about 70 different types of approaches to this and said, these are the ones we think work best. But for the built environment, uh, or you're, I think you were speaking to commercial real estate, um, I'm, it's something, but it's not everything. So we, uh, sharing those best practices, developing that, and also on residential real estate and retrofitting, I think is hugely important. There's been some innovation on that. Secondly, very quickly, uh, to the uh, question about uh, renewable and innovation, uh, we do need more innovation at a country level. That's what these JetP partnerships, we don't have time to go through it, but just if you remember that, and that's going to be a test case uh, for that. And then actually, Martin, I should hand back so you've got time for more questions. I can take, I think, probably just one more question. Um, uh, this gentleman here, because uh, um, I, I will be okay. shot if I run over schedule, but if you're very brief, I might manage to. Thanks, uh, Bastian. I'm a member of the Swiss Parliament, um, looking at net zero of Switzerland and also working at South Pole, looking at net zero of companies. So my question is, in financing net zero, uh, where do you see the role of Article 6 no, and, and carbon credits in, yeah. in enabling this? Okay. Do you want to comment on that, Mark? Uh, very quickly, yes. Um, I think the carbon credit market uh, can play an important role. It can give us 10, 15 percent additional carbon budget if done correctly. So uh, it's a huge opportunity. It's not clear that we will have that market at scale. Um, uh, we need high integrity on the s supply side. Good work's being done on that. The principles are going to come out. We implement that around. And then w the question is on the demand side for companies, what's their responsibility? Is it only when they get to 2040, 2050, and they've done everything they can that they have to uh, offset, so-called offset, or should they compensate for their emissions along that journey? There is an order of several orders of magnitude difference between those two. Um, the latter has the prospect of creating a very large market for carbon credits and offsets, which extend from, nat as you would know, from nature-based solutions all the way through to breakthrough uh, energy technologies. So uh, and the next, I would say, 12, 18 months are going to be critical whether, which path we, we choose. I'll take one more question. The lady there, yes, please. Please sit up, stand up. Uh, my name is uh, Zainab Osman, uh, Director of the Africa Program at the Carnegie Endowment in Washington, DC. My question is mainly for Mark and maybe for uh, Maktar. Um, how do we uh, expand uh, private capital, private investments for climate action uh, to emerging and developing economies? And I ask this question because uh, Bloomberg had a report a couple of months ago saying that GFANS has a uh, rich world bias. So I'm wondering if one thing that could help would be perhaps a greater clarity of roles among different financial institutions. So where uh, development finance institutions such as uh, IFC, et cetera, play a more de risking role to yep. allow yep. private you know, investment banks, others, be able to operate in emerging markets. I, Would that I, help? So, so let me, Sorry. let me, Mark, you have 20 yeah. seconds. Uh, 20 <laughs> seconds, uh, head on. Um, 
I, 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 I reject that, uh, uh, that uh, <laughs> characterization, the bias, uh, first point. Second, GFENS made clear we think we need to scale an additional trillion dollars a year, the world does, uh, to the emerging and developing world if we're going to be on track. And you, you did this in your opening comments. Uh, the issue is, are we going to have structures that include blended finance and very clear uh, elements of what is transition finance in, in the developing world, which is different than in the advanced world. We've made that clear. Uh, there's a new uh, uh, approach to this, which we're putting out uh, in the next few weeks. And we're working with the MDBs, including very much the IFC, which is one of the leaders on this, in terms of how we develop this. So I should give the last time for Yeah, Marta, sure. 10 seconds. Sorry. I agree with everything you said. Just add, this. we need also to think about developing the capital market in those countries. So part of it is that those capital markets are, no, are underdeveloped. So it limits also the, the ability to, to, to get those financing and intermediation. Yeah. So I um, have to bring this discussion, which I feel is just the beginning, um, to a close. And um, this is what I, what I have learned from this is there's actually been vastly more progress in this area, broadly defined, than most people could have imagined a few years ago. Uh, and this is, I'm sure, due in significant part to the efforts of all of you. Um, uh, second, uh, this is unbelievably complicated, and it's a whole system issue that, that's crucial. And the people who are here will play a part, but they will, they will definitely not determine the outcome. And there are lots of people who aren't, as it were, here and committed, who will play a big part in determining the outcome, and I'm not clear they are committed. And that we have to remember that we've got a long way further to go. Um, and uh, while we are making, I think, very, very substantial progress, we are, have very, very little time to start this. So I hope that everybody here will feel encouraged that progress is being made and remain fully aware that it doesn't begin yet to be enough. Uh, that's at least what I take away from this. Admittedly, it's what I thought before I came. But the, the, <laughs> this, this wonderful discussion and the issues that have been raised, which have been so clear and so well done, clarifies, I think, this sense, which is um, that, among many other things, complacency is an immense danger. Um, so thank the panelists. Thank you for listening. And I hope you've enjoyed it.